Good evening from Emerald Hill Skies. My name is Doug, and it's great to be with you again tonight. I see we've already got some folks there. Dennis, great to have you. The skies are clear here tonight, I'm happy to say. Uh, Scott Visions, it looks not bad there. <laughs> I guess you were looking in your uh, weather report, and you were absolutely correct. Uh, we're so glad that you made it as well. Uh, Dennis, it sounds like it's good where you are as well but you're in the process of moving. Sorry about that. <laughs> so nice of you to, to jump on board with us for a while. It is cold out there. I've got to say, we'll, we'll get our, um, our uh, USB control hub up here and that'll tell us the pocket power box and that'll tell us the temperature. There we go. Looks like it's uh, 22 degrees, 22.1 Fahrenheit out there. Uh, but we're inside, of course, in... Uh, shirt sleeves, happy to say. Uh, let's see, it looks like, uh, uh, Dennis, you're ready for summer. Uh, we're with you, man. I can't wait for my fingers to stop splitting open in this cold. Uh, anyway, great to have you guys here. I'm going to just check and make sure that uh, our audio is coming through, so you'll hear that. Yeah, there you go. Just want to make sure our audio is coming through. I'm excited that tonight we've got our um, scope already set up out there. This is a live view of the scope, and this is from a camera that's like a USB camera, you know. We've also got uh, our sky cam set up, and that great big spotlight you see there is the full moon. We're at 100% illuminated. If you uh, have been with us before, you know that we have a Rasa uh, just like this. It's a Rasa 11-inch. This is not a live view. This is just a photograph of our Rasa, but it... It was taken on a night just like tonight. And up on top of it, you might see we have that uh, little red uh, ASI 178 sky cam. And that's giving us this kind of an image uh, so we can see the sky at night and stay connected. Uh, you can see that we also have a, um, a Pegasus Astro uh, pocket power box micro. That's the little blue box you see on top there closest to you and then underneath it a little bit harder to see is another blue box a little bit larger and that's uh, Pegasus Astro's USB control hub and really happy with it uh, that's where we're getting these temperature readouts at the bottom of the scope we've got a uh, what we call a rig rack and it's got a uh, an AC 110 power filter on it and above that on the second level there's a 12 volt power supply a mean well power supply there. To the right of that is a rig runner 4005i and what that does is it takes the 12 volt power from that mean well power supply and filters it makes sure it's exactly right. As long as we end up with something between 12 and 14 and a half volts you can see the readout when we were testing it here was 14.07 and then above that is the uh, Icron what is it 3124 I think it is that we use to convert the data line from the scope into a fiber and then it crosses that fiber and comes into the office where I'm sitting. Uh, I actually did capture this picture tonight just moments ago. The picture on the left is the uh, ASI 2600, uh, the ZWO SI 2600 and that mounts as you can see on the front of the Rasa in front of the correction plate uh, and that's a pretty good view of that uh, Octopi Astro camera interface that holds it holds that ASI 2600 on. You can see the the power uh, cord coming to it from the right, and you can also see the um, data, the USB 3 data feeding out uh, toward the left. And then in the image on the right, you can see we've put the dew shield on. And these pictures, like I say, these were just captured moments ago. I just grabbed those so. Uh, it's always hard explaining to people where the camera is on a Rasa. And as you can imagine, this takes the place of the eyepiece. So we're not really able to have an eyepiece uh, uh, to be able to use a, a, a live view through glass. Instead, we use the camera in place of an eyepiece, and then we can share those camera views with you. So uh, this is the, the way it looks. You can see that rig rack on the right. And that was that's actually a live view. That's not a picture. That's uh, coming into you right now. So that rig rack is sitting there on that yellow 
uh, accessories box there. And you can see a little blanket I've got on top because it is kind of cold. Uh, like I say, it's 22 degrees, 22.1 degrees. And that equipment is really, uh, the, the equipment in the rig rack is really uh, spec specified down to about freezing. So we put a little blanket on there just to kind of keep that a little bit warmer than usual. Uh, we've also got our, let's see, I'm gonna try to get set up here so that we um, can see our, yeah, get it get set up so we can see our um, 2600. This is actually the, the ASI 2600 live view and those are real stars that you're seeing real time. And uh, I'm just gonna go over here and do a reset on that side histogram before I forget that. And let's connect this uh, mount. So that's done. Uh, I've just come from focusing. I, I use Nina uh, to be able to do an autofocus. Uh, and then tonight we've got uh, Starry Night Pro set up here and you know, we love Starry Night Pro. It's uh, a planetarium software and also um, it is, let's see, I think we're gonna leave that set up about like, maybe like about like that, how about that? And that way in Starry Night Pro, we'll pull this screen over and that way we can see a little bit more of our target list. How about that? Um, let's see. Boy, um, trying to make sure we're all set. Let's con let's connect our scope. Um, there's the scope connecting in Starry Night Pro. There you go. Took it a minute to connect, but there it's. It's just having to think about it for a second, isn't it? <laughs> um, Starry Night Pro is a planetarium software. It lets us see all the targets up in the sky. And we thought tonight we'd start with the Heart Nebula since it was Valentine's Day. Uh, there we go. And now up here in the status, it says the telescope is not... Oh, there it, there it goes. Just took it a minute to kind of think about that. So now we're gonna say a slew to the heart nebula. And let's, uh, let's let you see the sky cam there uh, so that you can follow the scope. And you can also look at the scope cam so that you can see it, uh, it moving a little bit. And here's the, the sky cam and now let's come back here. Um, I'm going to join you over here. Let's see. And then we'll put in here um, Heart Nebula. And let's do a, um, a plate solve here. Just because, again, the first three or four targets that we do at night, uh, we try to do that. Wow, Ernie, you're back. 10 degrees uh, near Buffalo. That's pretty cold. And uh, Frank, welcome, good to have you here. It is cold out there, Frank, I agree. And you know, by the time you set up, um, your hands are just uh, freezing. I try to wear gloves as often as I can, but some of this work, uh, you just can't uh, have gloves on. You can see the scope was about 2.09 degrees off. We use a uh, an, an Ioptron mount, a CEM70G, and we don't do any kind of um, star alignment with it. We just do polar alignment with the actual physical mount tripod. And then we do these plate solves, and that way we can align with the night sky. You know we're at 100% 100, uh, 100 moonlight tonight. And I thought about this. On a night when there's a full moon, do we... Do we do we just stay inside? Is that what we should do? And I'm thinking, no, we want to, we want to fight it. You know, in spite of 
what people might say. We want to try to fight it and see what we can see. <laughs> so we've just aligned. We're about 2.09 uh, degrees off. Let's start live stacking. And we'll just uh, reset that color balance and do an initial, an initial color balance here. Let's pull this um, exposure down to about 20 seconds and put the gain on maybe 100. And uh, let's reset this histogram at the bottom there. You can already see the heart there, can't you? We're going to bring those reds down a little bit. But right off the bat, you can see that heart, the outline of it at least. See the Valentine heart? That's fun. Um, obviously, that screen is super red. But uh, that does let you see the heart after just 36 seconds. And this is a tough, it's a tough target to try to image. This makes me wonder if maybe, um, Frank, what you've always told me, does it uh, maybe 20 seconds is too long. Um, sounds like you guys are comparing notes on the cold weather. Uh, we're already seeing the, the brightest parts of the heart nebula. But uh, we're going to leave the reds up there just a little bit. And then as, as our live stacking continues to deal with that, we'll try to push, try to push the um, image a little bit to pick up a little bit of that Valentine's Day looking heart nebula there. Can you see a a hint of it again. We'll keep um, keep pushing it there. I don't know if you can see, but up here is where the, the top of the heart will be. And try to push that a little bit more just so you can start to see it forming up there. Up here is where the top of the heart will be. And uh, let's see, bring this down just a little. So we can scoot this over to there, maybe, and then push these mids a little bit more. Look at that bright core starting to form up there. So this V, like I say, starts to come around the side. Every time you start to see it, another exposure comes in. This V comes around the side and comes down here to the bottom. This, this nebula is going to be full screen when it actually comes in. Let's, uh, let's go over to our Starry Night Pro here for a second. And let's, uh, let's show the info on this. And it's a diffuse nebula, as you can see. Here are past observations. Um, not very we haven't done very well on this and hopefully we're we're going to do better on it this time uh, got a strategy for it let's make sure our observing session has started uh valentine's day 214 10 30 yeah that should be able to start our session huh so let's change this observing session to that valentine vision session and then um, add the telescope the 2600 here now let's go back to the screen and take a look here at what we can see when we uh, yeah there it's starting to come in a little bit more there you can start to see the outline of the heart more just looks like a kid's Valentine they'd make on Valentine's Day. Bring this red down just a little bit more and try to get that red crest in line there with the others so we can put this bar right around there and then bring these mids over. Yeah. So you see this outline here. This is this heart nebula starting to form up here. This is a huge object. Uh, 
Let's start our uh, new log entry here. And we'll say, um, finally seeing a bit more of this nebula tonight by accenting the reds. Happy Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Go back over to the screen. And every time that, let's see, bring that dark over a little more. Look at that. Wow, if you really want to accent that, you can see about as much of it as you want, huh? By pumping up those mids. See that bright core? So in honor of Valentine's Day, uh, yeah, Ernie says it's, it's tough in broadband, especially the moon's so bright. You can still see it, though. Yeah, you kind of have to cheat a little bit with EAA and bring those mids way up. And then it accents all these reds here. We're at 5 minutes, 36 seconds, so that's actually not bad. The best images of Heart Nebula would be on a dark night without the moon, and it would maybe be like a three hours of integration. And then we get a lot better view of this Heart Nebula. But we just thought for Valentine's Day it's the place to start, you know. We've got several. Mash Tata Mountain, glad to have you. Uh, if you haven't said where you are yet, please give us a, an idea of where where you're logging in from. I I think, Ernie, you're up there in Buffalo area. Uh, of course, Frank, we know you're in Schenectady. Scott, I forget where you are. Mike, glad to have you from all the way out in Death Valley. Um, and uh, Mashed Potato Mountain. I'm not sure uh, where Mashed Potato Mountain is, but that sounds like a cool place to be. Every every frame we grab, just we got to move these this dark over a little bit more. Let's bring this red down just a hair. Not too much, though, because then we'll lose our Valentine's Day look. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Uh, starting with the Heart Nebula in honor of the holiday. This is a target that's always kind of scared me a little bit. Uh, the most I've ever been able to get is really just the bright core. And I just thought tonight, you know, I'm not going to be scared of this. In 100% bright moonlight, we're just going to tackle this thing. Uh, Mike, I bet you're like 65. I'm going to guess 65, and I didn't look that up either. Let's pull these mids over just one more notch, and then let's grab a um, save exactly a scene. And... Um, that's probably where we're going to stop uh, because, you know, we're trying to learn to do the uh, the whole fast thing. Mass Freedom Mountain, New York also. Boy, New York is represented really in full tilt tonight. Uh, finally, a decent image of the Heart Nebula. And with 100% moonlight. Wow. I like being able to just grab uh, the log here without going into Astro Planner. I love Astro Planner for planning things. Uh, I got to learn the, the number of this. It's IC1805. I kind of just call it the Heart Nebula, and I don't have this IC number memorized yet. IC1805. So I got to remember that. IC1805. You know, um, for our list, I thought maybe we would continue our list of uh, objects that are for light polluted skies. And you guys that were with us last time, you might remember the way that we're doing this. Um, we're using a working copy of a of a an observing list, and the working copy has the targets that we haven't. Uh, observed yet. And then what we do is we bring up uh, a web view of live sky and 
we we use live sky because it has the power dog guessed it 65 degrees i knew it mike because uh live sky has the power to delete objects from uh, observing lists so we're going to use this to delete objects and let's just check and see if heart nebula is on here it's not i see 1805 not on here so that was not an object for light polluted skies and i'm not surprised because it is hard to pull that in uh, then we'll when we're done observing an object we'll transfer it to the observed list you know and so that's the way we're going to work tonight so let's figure out what objects are available for us and then what we'll do is we'll put them in order by altitude so we can sort by altitude here and it has us going to caster caster as a um, a double star and i don't mind that really i'm not much of a double star guy but you know uh, on the other hand uh, i don't mind that really let's see i i guess you guys are seeing um yeah, you guys are seeing this. So, so on the on the sky cam it looks like that, and on the scope cam it looks like that. And then uh, back to the screen. Here we are. We really don't need to stack this, but let's do um, zoom in. So you guys are on the screen now, right? Yeah. Let's do. Oh, we'll plate solve as well because we're still making our model. Uh, you know, like I've said before, first three or four, maybe first three or four targets, we do plate solving, and that lets the mount establish parity with the sky, so it knows where the images are up there, and it's sort of like, it's kind of like, I guess you could compare it to a blind person walking around the living room, kind of feel where everything is and get oriented. So now it's just 0.11 degrees off. You remember it was 2.09 the first time. And now on the second target, it's already at 0.11. So it's improved that much very quickly. This is this double star. And uh, that's what we're supposed to be seeing. Let's see here. Um, Caster, let's bring up our, our show info here. And we'll put it over here to the side. And then we'll go back to the live view. So this is the live view. Double stars usually take some mag focal length to separate, not what Rosses are good for. Yeah, but I think this is it, isn't it? Aren't we, aren't we separating it there? Let's see what it says. Um, Caster gives some mythology. Um, though Caster is the fainter, the two silver uh, Caster's in from, uh, uh, it's the brightest of the second magnitude stars. Um, coming in just behind Adhara and Canis Major, Castro and Pollux make the most attractive side at the northern end of Gemini. So let's look at that real quick just so you can see. Uh, to do that, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll center on um, Castor in our planetarium software. Because right now, you know, we're still, I think we'll center on it. What in the world? So you go there, um, select caster. Hmm. Well, I'm just going to move this out of the way for a second and go like this and say, we already slewed there. We are there. So that's weird, isn't it? What's going on? What's going on? View our telescope control. Oh, we lost connection to the telescope. Tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna close this real quick and and I don't know what happened there, but we're gonna open up Starry Night again. And I gotta say that wasn't really showing off its capabilities, was it? 
Okay, we're back in Starry Night again. There's our telescope panel. Telescope control, connect. Okay, now we're back. Now we'll go to um, our lists again and filter out for 111 objects for light polluted skies, sort by altitude, and now we'll center on caster. Now we're cooking. And as you can see, as we pan there, um, as we pan there, we look at constellations and uh, there's Castor and you can see Pollux here on the left of Gemini. And you can see the scope is with us. This is the um, field of view of the scope and that little crosshair means the scope is here with us. And we're gonna be able to see this double star here is the one we're seeing that's real close. And then there's, this star is not really related to Castor. Ah, look. So the double star is pretty tight. Wow, I don't know whether we're separating that or not. Mike, you might be right. Let's go back here and let's zoom in to 200%. Man, I'm afraid you're right, Mike. We're probably not separating that. That looks like it's more likely. Um, more likely Tycho 2453-1918-1 unless Tycho 2453-1918 is Castor. Let's open that up. Uh, show info. Tycho 2457. No, so sadly, I think we're not separating that just exactly like Mike said. I'm afraid we're not separating that. It looks like we would need to go to one degree to separate that. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's, um, let's lower the, let's go back to the screen. Let's lower the, exposure a little bit. That's on 400 gain. Let's lower the gain down to 100 and just make sure we can't separate this. No, I don't think it is separating it. I can zoom in there. Try to match these with the stars that are in. Oh, it's three binary star systems. Um, gotcha. Mike, you're the man. So this triangle, let's give it just a little more light to get to get acclimated. To make sure we're seeing what we're we're able to sort out what we're seeing. So there's that triangle. Let's, let's go up to um, 300 gain, just to make sure we're catching all the dim stars there. So there's that triangle, and those two kind of make a gateway for those two stars to shine through. Now let's go back to the planetarium software and back off just a little bit. So these two, do you guys think these two stars are part of the system? Doesn't look like it, does it? 
Looks like these are numbered by a different a different system. Look at those doubles there. Still. Oh, I see. We're gonna those are minute, arc minutes. Yeah, I think with our um Rasa frame of view, I think. Mike, you're right. I think we're going to have trouble separating that. So let's just put this in the um, in the observation here. And by the way, now we're working off of this. And that observing list. And let's say the Rasa wide field probably was not separating the uh, tightest pair of stars. Um, we were seeing a couple of stars nearby, but it didn't look like they were part of the caster system. We need something with a little more focal length. Again, the um, the Rasa, Mike was spot on. The Rasa with about, uh, what is it, 460 focal length? Um, let's see. Get my notes here for the Rasa uh, right here. Um, here we go. Six hundred twenty millimeters focal length f two point two. So at six hundred twenty, we're just not quite separating that inner that inner star. But nice clusters nearby. All right. Well, then let's go to sixteen Cancri. 16 Cancri, and I wonder why we're viewing that. 16 Cancri, is it another double? Why do they have us just going to look at a star, pray tell? Huh. 16 Cancri. Well, you know, we're just going to do it uh, just because it's there, huh? And again, you guys can look at the... Um, the sky cam and the um, scope cam and then um, 16 Cancri back at the screen itself it's a little bit wide here for us huh? we don't need quite that much width we're using, uh, in case you're interested, we're using a Celestron light pollution filter. It's the one they sell for the Rasa 11. And it's a fairly expensive filter. I don't know if you've ever priced that, but it, it is fairly expensive. Oh, look, we're getting some, we just panned past the moon. Did you see that? Let's do another plate solve as soon as this slows down. And this should get us within hopefully a, an arc minute or two max for our model of the night sky so that our our um, mount is synchronized. Looks like we were 0.18 degrees off now. So 18 one hundredths, almost two tenths of a degree off. So our, our mount is indeed synchronizing with the night sky so that we won't have to keep plate solving. Let's put this... Um, was it called? Uh, let's make this big enough so we can see this alongside 16 can cree. Boy, it just shows my first time I've been on these targets before. 16 can cree. Um, I'm assuming that's it right in the middle. Whatever 
whatever 16 Cancri is all about, that's it. And we'll just zoom in on it. Now let's read about it. Why do they have us going to 16 Cancri? We're going to show info here. 16 Cancri, general info. This is not even a double star. Zeta Cancri. <laughs> I guess they just thought this was a great star to go look at on a moonlit night. <laughs> Wondered, why are we observing <laughs> this guy? I think the guy who made this list wanted to have 110 targets, just like um, the um, uh, Messier list had. So he thought, let's go look at this 16 Cancri and... Uh, It'll be an interesting object for people to see. Teg, teg mine. You can see if you get close enough at 23 minutes of arc minutes, you can see it is a, a double star as well. So that's probably what they were, they had in mind. If you had a um, a longer focal length to be able to separate this, you know that does look a little bit oblong, doesn't it? Looks a little bit oblong. We might be barely starting to see some duplicity about that by just a, a little bit. All right, now let's go look at this 12 lensis. How would you pronounce that? 12 lensis. M35 would be a nice open cluster. All right, M35 is coming up as a matter of fact. Ernie, it's just uh, two objects down here. Let's, let's center on this 12 lensis. And let's see the sky cam. There's the sky cam and the scope cam. You know, I'm kind of excited about this new little um, gizmo I have so I can choose the screens for you guys to look at. I'm just going to try to grab this camera for a second and see if I can show you guys this uh, new little stream deck. I'm kind of excited about this. What this does, it lets me pick. Uh, I can pick, you know, the scope cam or the sky cam or show the full screen. These were those images you saw at the beginning. Kind of excited about this new little thing. It's called a stream deck. Kind of exciting to try to learn to use this tonight. Anyway, back to the, um, back to the full screen. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion that we're looking at this object here, but we'll let it um, we'll let it plate solve there. Uh, let's see. This time we were just 0 0.14 degrees off, so we're getting closer. <laughs> uh, let's see. We're going to. Um, 12 lin lenses. 12 lenses. How would you pronounce that, guys? Ernie says M44 is in that general area, too. There's 12 lenses, however you pronounce that. And it just says it's a star as well. <laughs> Why are we looking at these stars? <laughs> Somebody who made this list, like I say, they were pretty, <laughs> pretty hard up trying to get that. That might be a double as well. Look how it's kind of starting to look like it's oblong. Not a lot of description here about it. Anyway, we'll say, well, it's a, oh, here. I showed this this past week to uh, the guys at Simcur. So now they're aware that this is happening. And uh, they're going to look at it in the next release. They, they kind of hinted that maybe they would try to uh, do a new release just right after this. Uh, let's see. This was... I hinted they would do a new release right after they got Star Sky Safari 7 sorted out. 
you're still kind of this was a oh, I want you to know still this is having to do this um, the fourth time it's the first time I've ever this was a beautiful star all right now let's go to m37 m37 is an open cluster and again we'll let you guys look at the sky cam for a second and the scope cam isn't that fun to have this little dream deck here so And then we'll come back to the, um, oh yeah, look at that little cluster. That is a beautiful little cluster. Look at those, looks like there are a hundred stars there. Let's, let's go look at that, um, M37. This naked eye cluster is a joy to observe and undoubtedly the best open cluster in Auriga and a favorite amongst observers. Dozens of bright stars can be resolved. Fainter white stars surround a red ninth magnitude star near the center of this cluster. See that little reddish star in the middle? I'm colorblind, but I can tell that's a different tint. Uh, color deficient, I guess I should say. In the center of the cluster, adding its aesthetic beauty. A telescope and careful observation reveals several dark voids within the cluster, which are dust lanes of the Milky Way. Wow, how exciting. Let's go in at um, 66% here. Wow, there's that red star in the middle. And uh, this is a beautiful salt and pepper deal, huh? We said incredible group of tightly packed, gorgeous, million points of light. So the cluster is so packed with stars. Looks like there are hundreds in our frame. Um, the great thing about this open cluster is that it even looks gorgeous on a 100% moonlit night. How about that? Just beautiful. M44 is close as well. I don't know why they didn't uh, send us to M44. Let's grab a uh, snapshot of this. Whoops, sorry. Shouldn't change that name. Now they're gonna let me change that, aren't they? M37. I think they're gonna let me rename that, aren't they? Or maybe not. Whoop, M30. Seven M thirty seven. No, I'm gonna have to do another snapshot. There we go. It's a beautiful cluster on a one hundred percent moonlit light. I'm just gonna look at the sky for a second. I'm gonna go over and look at the sky myself. Let's see. The sky would be right there. Wow, that is a mess how close we are to the moon. Let's go back down to 0.75 milliseconds. There's the moon in all of its glory. Man, how in the world we can see anything that close to the moon, I will never know. shows where we're looking basically kind of off up in the northwest northwest let's go back to starry night pro for a second and back off of this and so we're right here at m37 let's center on that center on m37 and then There's, see, where's the moon? I wonder why the moon doesn't jump out to us. Oh, there it is. 
Yeah, so it is, let's measure that. So you can change this to angular separation. So there, it's about um, 40 degrees away. But at 40 degrees away, it's still just incredible point of light. That moon is like a bright searchlight, isn't it? All right, we're off to M35. And uh, we'll also center on M35. Ernie's realizing we had a list there, yeah. We're working off this list of the 111 best objects for light polluted skies. And there you can see we're at another open cluster. Uh, now let's go back to our screen and head back over to sharp cap there and just check our plate solving one more time. And this is you no know, with this with this the way it is I can't quite see M thirty five, right? Yeah, M35. We'll put that at the top here. 0 0.03 degrees. Now we're talking. So three hundredths of a degree off now with this plate solve. So we won't have to plate solve anymore. This is a pretty good size open cluster if you stop and think about it. That's the middle of a full framed Rasa frame. So that's a huge open cluster. Let's go here and look at this info. Sometimes it'll show a large and bright open cluster, the gathering of several hundred stars, the glorious sight, binoculars and small telescopes forming a myriad of loops and lines. The fainter open cluster, NGC 2158, is a mere half degree distant, provides a good contrast with M35. Let's get a picture of that, NGC 2158. So down here, so it should be in our field of view, what, down here? Hmm. Oh, look, down here. Look at that. I'm not sure you'll be able to see that in the YouTube view, but it's kind of cool. This is 2158. Right there in the center. Let's brighten that up a little bit. Maybe go with eight seconds so you can make those stars out a little bit more. This is NGC 2158. Let it gather that frame right here. It's a cool, a cool contrast, huh? Of that really, really faint open cluster. And then um, the huge M35. We'll do a snapshot of that and then um, go here and add M35 was super large. Saw, um, what was it? M rats. Now I forget the name. Can we go over and look? NGC 2158. Yes, we can. NGC 2158. Much fainter. One half degree away. I wonder if we should also just for good measure, so we learn how to do this, just go up here and say NGC 2158. Whoa, losing my mouse. Where was I? Back to here, there. NGC 2158. Yeah, much fainter open cluster, also known as a galactic cluster. Many open clusters have a relatively large. And 
we'll just say um, caught this in the field of view with M35, much fainter. Okay. Now we'll go back. I don't know what's the quickest way to go back. I guess we have to go back to our list like this. Filter for that again. And then do the altitude search. And we're back at M35, which we finished. Now here's a double star. I don't know if we'll be able to separate that. 126 light years away. It doesn't say how wide the separation is. But let's uh, center on it. Algiaba, Algiaba, Algiaba. So let's see. There's the scope slewing and the sky cam. This is in Leo. It's right at the um, the neck of Leo, as you can see here. And let's go over here. And now we can go back down to four seconds, I think. Maybe five. Well, we did cover, oh, it's because I'm zoomed in. So there's Al Giaba, for whatever that's worth. Oh, look. See how that kind of gets a little oblong. Is that a double star? Al Giaba. Al Giaba. Gamma Leonis, 41 Leonis. A double giant with a planet. Double stars dot the sky, and this is just the. Many of the favorites of amateur observatory nights, some like those make up Mizar and Ursa Major are plain white, while others like Iberio exhibit a beautiful color contrast. Um, even when the colors are fairly similar, the eye enhances them, rendering close and equal pairs like second magnitude Algiaba, Gamma Leonis, the two components just 4.7 seconds of arc apart. Quite lovely. Smith and Chambers in the 19th century calling Gamma a splendid double star, bright orange and greenish yellow. Let's go see what we can see. We're at already at 185% there. Boy, with our wide field. Ernie, thanks for being with us here. Glad you stopped by. And there's several others on the stream as well still. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't, told us where you're from you're welcome to do that we're, we're glad to have you without rasa we can't quite separate separate this but you can perhaps if you use your imagination perhaps you can see that's just a little bit oblong so there's the double nature of it but we're not able to split it with the rasa field of view since it's such a wide field of view here so we'll just admit that we weren't able to split this double with our rasa. We'll have to get um, another amateur with like Frank's telescope. I think Frank, you have a, what is it, 1100? Um, 1100 focal length would split this, I bet. Maybe this is why I haven't ever done very many double stars before. Bode's Nebula. Wonder if that, it's a spiral galaxy. Let's slew there. Now notice this is in twice. That's odd, isn't it? Why would they put this in twice? Sure enough it is though. back to our screen let's go back to our 2600 you can already make out something there's some kind of a splotch there let's go back to our full auto now if I put in Bode's Nebula I'm not really being fair to the number 
Let's go back and get the number. Bode's Nebula is M81. 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 Okay. Let's, we don't need to plate solve this. You can see it right there in the middle. Let's live stack this. And I think it needs clearing, doesn't it? And let's change our exposure to maybe 15 seconds and our gain down to about 200. We'll do a color balance on that. You can see the core. Looks like we're seeing another target here. You guys probably, oh, Mike, you had it memorized. Bodes equals MA81. It's awfully hard to remove the hyperstar. Once you image at F2, you're spoiled. <laughs> yep. You're going to go back to F6.3 when galaxy season starts. That puts you back at 1,280 millimeters. I bet you can split these stars. Um, let's come down to here. We're at 15 seconds. So this is what? M81, and is that M82? You guys that have these memorized. I'm going to go back over to Starry Night and cheat because I don't have this memorized. M82, yeah. M81 and M82. And if we're lucky, I don't know if we got NGC 3077 in here, but at least M81 and M82 are in the same frame, fortunately. I don't know if we got the other one. Yep, Cigar Galaxy on the left. Boy, you can already see a bright core there, can't you? Let's make that sky a little darker. Man, I'm amazed that with the moon tonight at 100%, that after 98 seconds we can already see this kind of detail. Aren't you guys amazed? I'm amazed. I'm going to bring the greens down. Oops, there went our galaxy. It's depending on those greens, isn't it? Let's uh, pull in on that part of the frame. Get used to using this mass wheel. So fun. Look at the core of M82. So Bodes is here on the right. You can already see the dust lanes. Try turning down the saturation slider. Saturation. This one here. Oh, I think you're right, Frank. Good call. Well done, thanks. <laughs> Why? Why do you say that, Mike? Just because I'm continuing to learn? <laughs> hey, tonight, by the way, is the 50th observation session. 50 sessions. I should have learned something by now. <laughs> uh, M81 is looking amazing on a 100% moonlit night. How does this work? I mean, there are guys who wouldn't even set up their telescopes, right? On a 100% moonlit night? <sighs> After just three minutes, we already saw quite a lot of galaxy structure several dust lanes and at least two arms. Wow. So that's what it would look like after, say, three hours of integration. And look what we're getting after just 
four minutes. Frank says it's one of his favorite. Dennis says one of the first galaxies he ever looked at. Let's zoom in a little more on just the M81 side. Let's see if I hold down the control key Frank taught me, I can zoom in. Still quite a lot of noise there. We're um, we're at 200 game, 15 seconds. But you know, we're starting to pick up these stars that are in these arms. And remember, if we go over to um, Starry Night Pro, see these stars starting to show up in these arms? Those are probably, I'm guessing those are stars in that galaxy. I bet they're not stars that are just in the way of us viewing it. Wow. And look at this dust lane. And look at all this fiery nebulosity being thrown out here like the spiral arms, you know. Look at that bright core. Let's read about this for just a second. Where did it go, by the way? Oh, Bode's Nebula. Um, Description. M81 and M82 are perhaps the most famous pair of galaxies in the sky. Whoop, I forget that I have to hold the control key down. Um, perhaps the most famous pair of galaxies in the sky, and both can be seen in the same low magnification field of view. Both are spiral galaxies, but M81 is nearly face on, while M82 is edge on. The contrast offered by these two galaxies is one of the visual delights of the night sky. M81 is one of the brightest galaxies in the Messier catalog and can be seen with most binoculars. Long exposure photographs display two prominent spiral arms. Long exposure, like six minutes. Um, which may also be observed with larger telescopes. M81 and M82 are separated by only 150,000 light years. This is just a mere 150,000 light years. Tens of millions of years ago, the larger and 10 times as massive M81 uh, passed close by its smaller neighbor, inducing a round starburst formation in M82. Let's zoom in on that. Oh, there I go. I'm using that drop down again. When in reality, I need to learn to use this control zooming deal. Look at that. I guess that's starburst formation. Now I see, Frank, you're asking, have we ever tried the enhancement tab? What is the enhancement tab here? Oh my goodness, what in the world? Noise reduction, Gaussian blur. No, I haven't. Are you suggesting I should try this? What would you recommend we start with, Preto? I have no idea what to do with this tab. Just so you know, no idea. Um, what I have in this tab is off and off. So, Somebody with a little more experience is going to have to tell me what to do here. Uh, Gaussian blur. Boy, that is amazing the way we're starting to see whatever those are, right? Wow. On a 100% moon. So shall I just try these, Frank? What does a Gaussian blur do? Oh my goodness, I think if you go to the Gaussian blur, it actually gets rid of some of that bright core. I don't like that one. Bilateral filter. I don't see much effect. Sharpening, unsharp mask. Oh, that actually brought out a little more of the core. Look, without zooming in anymore, 
that bam just makes that core pop doesn't it use the bilateral filter and the unsharp mask both huh so many features to sharp cap radius and amount okay so this was on one oh yeah i can see the grain is starting to change its shape I think it looks better on one, to be honest. But I do like the way the unsharp mask radius made that inner core pop a little more. I don't understand it. What is Wiener Deconvolution? I don't like Gaussian. Bilateral is better. Okay, I'm going to try bilateral again. Boy, it just makes it fuzzier for my eyes. Hmm. I'm going to try the Wiener Deconvolution. Nah. Doesn't look good on this object. The unsharp mask did look a little bit better, makes it pop a little more. Gaussian is just a Photoshop holdover. I like the bilateral and unsharp. Hmm. Boy, bilateral on this object makes makes it look fuzzy. There's bilateral. And there's off. Hmm. Okay, let's use the unsharp mask. Wiener deconvolution is more aggressive sharpening, but take more CPU power. Huh. Okay, guys. Well, that's fun. I'll tell you what we can do. We can move this over just a little bit, and that'll get that sky a little bit darker. Okay, I'm going to do a um, a screenshot of just this. So this is M82. Save as. And let's make sure we're in our correct, and we aren't. Um, sharp cap captures. This is M82. And this is 11 minutes, um, 50 frames on 2022-02-14. Doug, is that everything we'll need on Messier Marathon Night? I think it is, isn't it? And then let's um, let's go over and look at M81. Oh my, isn't that amazing? It's, there was some kind of a thing here that happened. Look at that. It's weird, isn't it? Oh, there, it got rid of it. Uh, I'm gonna do a um, screen. Snapshot grab of that too. M81. Wow. It's amazing. Who knew? M81. Um, 2022-02-14. Oh, and I need to... Oh, this is where we say... Um, 13 minutes, 55 frames. We need to decide what order those are in. It should be object date, shouldn't it? Object date. 
That's so fun. That just looks otherworldly, doesn't it? Oh, well, duh, it is. Changes are very subtle. I wish that the enhancement settings would say between sessions. I wonder if anyone has requested that. Huh. So they don't, huh? Between sessions. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next target. And while we're here, this was M81. Let's go back here and do M82. Look, they don't have M82 listed. So if I just go here and say M82, mm, what do you make it? Oh, there it is. And I just do a new observation and say, wow, those bright fireball core objects were amazing with M81 in the same frame. And this was not on that 111 objects for some reason that I saw. Now if I do this, do I have to go back to lists again? And filter for that. And sort for this. That was Bose Nebula. I wonder why this is here. Let's go over to um, um, Live Sky and let's look up, let's see, edit the working copy, Bodes. Sure enough, there are two. Oh, look, one is a mistake. That's Bose Nebula, and this should have been M82. Does it let us edit this? Hmm. Hmm. Let's remove it. And then let's go back to um, Starry Night Pro. And in this observation list, Let's edit this and find bodes. Well, we didn't remove it from this, did we? Um, see, they're not, you can't put them in alphabetical order here, sadly. So let's remove it from the other. But what we can do is add, can't we? Look, it doesn't let you add a, an object. Oh, I know how we can do it. Um, let's close that. Let's go back over here in Live Sky and let's also go to the observing list, the master observing list for this, this one. And let's remove bodes from it. Or, yeah. This one is the mistake. So we're going to edit this and remove this. And now let's go back to our working list again, just so we don't get lost. And now back in Starry Night Pro, here's what we do. We look up M82 and we say add to observing list. We add it to, uh, it's not going to let us do that one, is it? Because we didn't create that, but we can add it to this. Um, that's odd, isn't it? That it doesn't let you change the one that you imported from another person's I guess they figure, well, you can copy it and then change the one you copy. 
So now, um, M82 is here, see? And it will be from now on. Good. All right, we stopped live. I wish that the announcement said, or we stopped um, live stacking. So we're ready to move. Mm, let's go to the next target, which is M36. Seven, and we'll back away here. And so there you're seeing the scope. That's so fun to see that scope slew, isn't it? It's a lot of fun. And then here is the sky. And this is M35. We're down at the base of Chimney. Didn't we already see M35? I thought we already did that. Yeah, we already did that tonight. I should be checking these. Look at that. Algebra 12. Bodes 82. 37, did we do 37? Show info, 214, yeah, we did 37. Uh, we did 35. Did we do M67? I don't remember that. Show info, no, we didn't do that. M67, let's do to M67. So this is um, this is trying to learn this new workflow using the check marks during the session, and then before we close the session, moving all these to the observed list so that they won't be here next time. That's the workflow that that we want to use. Um, so I was not checking them as we go. I'm going to go ahead and check M67 now to show that we're there. This is an open cluster as well. You can see the sky cam as well. Again, your scope. Uh, we're looking at the scope from behind it as if we were looking toward the North Star. So when we when we look at the scope pointing straight up like that, it is, um, you notice it went over toward the east and then it came back so that it's pier east now. And then we're looking basically straight up. And M67, Here we are. So look at Starry Night Pro for a second. Nice open cluster there. And then we'll go back over to Sharp Cap. Lots of moonlight, but part of this is just because we have everything dialed up. Our gain is on 400. Can take that back down to 300 maybe. But there's a nice open cluster. This is M67. Nice tight cluster, gorgeous. Lots of salt and pepper stars, all different colors strewn across 25 arc minutes. Um, so we'll say an observation 
and go back here, say even, beautiful, and 100% moonlight. Un unaltered. That's the thing about these open clusters. They look just as good in um, moonlight. Mike says, looks like the scope came down against the tripod leg. Yeah, I think that's just an optical <laughs> delusion, <laughs> like Mike says, yeah. Papa Tech, good evening. Good to have you here, Papa Tech. Do you have uh, nice, nice clear weather in Florida? So we've logged this M67. So again, we checked that. Let's go ahead and catch up with what we do here. So we go... What we're going to do is we're going to say add to observing list observed. Add to observing list observed. Add to observing list observed. Now let's go erase caster, 16 Cancri, and M67. So we're back here. We make sure we're in working copy and we edit. And we say caster and that was weird. Working copy, edit M sixty seven. wonder if it only shows up no m67 wonder why m67 is not showing up there oh it had a space that's weird <laughs> uh, we can edit that and then the other one was the one that said can cream why is it doing this um, why is it making me go back out and back in again? Can Cree Canary Can Cree hmm. Can Cree must not be spelling it correctly. 16 space cancri picky 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 okay so i must have to say 16 space cancri it still isn't showing it do you think it's case sensitive what about just 16. it's not finding it is it working copy 16 zero entries Huh, that's very odd, isn't it? Because in, um, in Starry Night Pro, it thinks it's there. Anyway, um, and then we also observed algebra. It looks like algebra. Algebra and 12 linces. So we go add to observed and add to observed. Algebra and 12 linces. Here we go. Algebra, algebra. Algebra, there we go. I misspelled it. And mm, edit and twelve Lin. Okay. And 
bodes add to observing list observed m82 observed m37 observed and m35 observed so bodes 82 37 35 hut hut hike bodes Good night, Dennis. Um, working copy. At Bodes. I wonder what, how I can do this workflow so I don't have to go back out each time. Um, what was the next one? Somebody help me remember. M87, was it? Uh, let's see. Maybe if we make this smaller. There we go. This is better. Better workflow. M82. Now, how can I make it let me search again? Save, maybe? Yeah. M30. No. M37. Delete, save. M thirty five. Delete, save. Now I think we're all caught up. So what happens is then, if we go back to lists, uh, maybe we have to search for something else first. Now I'll go back to lists and do this working copy again. And then sort by altitude again. Most of those are gone. 16 Cancri. Look, it shows us it's already unobserved. I like that. So I wish we could just delete it. 16 CANCRI. I wonder why it's not letting us find it here. 16. Space 16? Cancri. That's weird. Okay, so they're all here. All the objects are here in one list. Let's just go Control F and look for 16. Doesn't find itself there. Well, I guess we'll find it later. Did we get rid of M82? Hmm. Guess we did. These probably what happened was here we need to go um, sync with cloud now and let it sync and then after it sinks, sort again, and I bet they'll be gone now. We probably have to remember to say sync with cloud. Yeah, 
Good, we're all cut up. Except we can't get rid of the 16 can cree for some reason. And I don't know what's wrong with that. Do you think there's a space in front of the one? Anyway, let's don't worry about it now. We'll find it later. Uh, 54 Leonis is another star. Why is it having us go to a star? But you know what? We'll do it. We're going to go to a star. Okay, so you can see we're pointed northeast, a little bit east. There's the portion of the sky we're seeing. Moonlit, of course. Back to our screen. And there's our star. It's a star, all right. Strange. Let's read about this star that we slewed to go see. 54 Leonis. Show info. The most northerly of a triangle of fainter stars to the northwest of Leo's hind quarters. Okay, let's go see this. Um, let's see more center. Um, which includes 60 and 72 Leo. Flamsteed's 54 Leonis lies six degrees northwest of Zosma and almost on the border of Leo Minor, the lesser lion. As a pretty fourth magnitude visual double as seen through a telescope is rather special, the pair consisting of white class A, A1 and A2 dwarfs, six seconds of arc apart. Look at that. Yeah, we're not going to be able to split these on a rasa. Um, writing from the 19th century, Smith and Chambers say, a neat double star just over the lion's back where it is preserved from the lesser lion by one of the map maker's nooks. A four and a half white and a B7 gray. Huh. You make of that. This is a beautiful object. Study of the star goes way back. The first measures of separation were as long ago as 1777, none other than William Herschel, recording one in 1781, yet the pair still presents a considerable mystery. The distance is essentially unknown as the duplicity evidently messes up the parallax. The average absolute visual brightness for this for the spectral class as compared to the apparent magnitude gives 180 light years for brighter 92.4.5, 54 Leo A, but nearly double that for sixth magnitude, not seventh as Smith and Chambers had it, 54 Leo B, showing that something is wrong someplace, that the stars are not average. You know, we just don't see a lot of this in our Rasa, do we? Maybe we can see that it's oblong, but that's about it. So double stars are not the Ross's forte. But you get Frank with his 1280 millimeter focal length. He would be able to split this. As a result, the chemical abundance are not confused. Um, let's go ahead and say that going to have to um, go back over here and open this up again. New observation. We just could not split this in a 600, what did I say Ross had? 640 was it? Where was that? Here we go. 620. And a 620 millimeter rasa. Sadly. It's 
So this basically becomes like a star to us. Anyway, we observed it. So we can go add to observing list, observed, and then back here in live sky, we we look for um 54 leo Fifty four Leo and we remove it. Okay, save. Alula Australis. It's another double star. Ooh, I hope we can see this one. Okay, there's the sky cam. Just to see where the scope is pointing now. You can see the scope. Here's the screen. Uh, these are tight. I bet we won't be able to split it again. No, I don't think so. Just not a double star scope, is it? Show info. Ursa Major walks on legs identified by three pairs of close but unrelated stars that the ancient Arabs called the springs of the gazelle. Hmm. Look at all this. I guess people that are really into double stars would really love this, wouldn't they? Couldn't split it. Not with 620. Um, observed. And then we go back over here. We must have to go like this out and in again. Alula. Alula. M105 is an elliptical galaxy. There goes the sky cam. There goes the scope. Pretty fast. Here we are in Starry Night Pro. Oh, look, there are two galaxies here. Let's go look at this. NGC 3384 and M105. Oh, three. 3389, 3384, and M105. Yeah, look. I think we can see them. Let's back off. M105. And let's change this to 10 seconds. And let's put our gain at 200. And five stack clear so while it's bringing in the first screen the first uh, subframe we don't see a lot I think that might be one of them right there yeah Or 
here. You know what? Let's stop this for a second. And let's um, plate solve. I'll show you why. We want to be able to use this annotation thing that Sharp Cap has built in. When there are several objects in the frame like this, this is really helpful. Point 0.17 degree off. Man, the Ioptron is a good mount. Um, now we can start live stacking again as soon as it's settled. Let's let it settle just a little bit longer. Maybe till we get one additional frame. There we go. Should be enough now. And let's clear that out. And um, we still have several on the live stock. If you'd like to say hello, what we'll do here is we'll um, we'll use this annotation deal, deep sky image annotation, and this will show us what we're looking at. So here's M105. Let's zero in just a little bit. Here's M105, otherwise known as NGC 3379. And this is NGC 3384. This is NGC 3389. So here's that triangle. But look, we've also got NGC 3368 up here. Let's go back to um, Starry Night Pro. So there's M105, excuse me, NGC 3384, NGC 38, 3389. But I don't think Starry Night Pro, oh yeah, it's just outside the frame here. M105. Those just look like globs, don't they? And this is another glob, but this one you can see a little bit of spiral structure. Let's go back here and see what we're seeing. Isn't that annotation fun? Let's just see exactly what we're looking at here. Let's take it back off for a second. And let's... Actually, that color matching is not bad. Let's zoom in here. Yep. Glob, glob, spiral. Hmm. A lot of gray in there. But it's just two minutes. But you can definitely see the elliptical nature of M105, which is our original goal here. By elliptical, an elliptical galaxy, we mean it doesn't really have a spiral shape. And in fact, it doesn't have much shape at all. It's just a glob. This one, you can already start to tell it's going to be a spiral shape. These others are just going to be globs. Let's go back over to Starry Night Pro and read about M105, elliptical galaxy. M105 lies close to M95 and M96. Together, the three galaxies make up the Leo group. And all three can be seen in the same field of view with binoculars. Telescopically, M105 is a bright central region which fades gradually towards the periphery. At M105 center is a 50 million solar mass object. Wow. 50 million the size of our sun. Two fainter spiral galaxies lie very close to M105. NGC 3384 is a 10th magnitude galaxy distant, and 12th magnitude NGC 3389 is 10 
and that must mean light years away. These were beautiful even in a 100% moonlit night. So we go add to observing list observed. We go back over here, observing lists, working copy, edit, M105, remove, save, M95, M96, very close to there. Yeah, with the moonlight, I think that's going to be about all we can do tonight. Is that again? Um, deep sky image annotation. M96 is here. Look at our focus, just a little bit off now. See the little donuts indicating our focus is off? That's at 86%. That's at 100%. So just a little bit out of focus now, huh? We'll go fix that. You can already see that this galaxy is more like a spiral, huh? Not our best image of M96. Not our best image of M96. Moonlit, um, slightly out of focus by the time we arrived here. What happens is as the telescope cools down and we are at 20 degrees now. So whenever the telescope changes, even two degrees, it can get off a of focus. So you've probably been with us when we focused before. Stop live stacking and uh, disconnect the camera. We go to, hello, Curtis. Good to see you, Curtis. We go to Nina. You know what, I think also, we ought to um, close sharp cap so it completely gets rid of its connection to the focuser. And in Nina, we connect the camera and the focuser. And then we go here to imaging and start autofocus. And the rest is just all automatic. It starts, um, what it does is it takes a picture of the sky and measures the width of the stars. Actually, it's the half flux radius. Measures the luminance of the half of the flux. And then um, it compares, it, t it moves the focuser, the focus motor, and then it takes another picture and compares what it found in the first picture. Then it moves the focus motor takes another picture, and it um, compares again, and then it starts making a graph of all those different comparisons. So what you're gonna see here a second, in a second is that graph starting to form up. And as it 
uh, moves the focuser to different positions, it looks for trend lines. And it even tries to make a curve, a hyperbolic curve of those findings. And what it's trying to do is search for the low point in that hyperbolic curve. So if everything goes well, by the time we're done focusing, we should get something that looks like a giant, you know, open U shape. And what it's looking for is the bottom of that trough so that we can basically read the hyperbola of the bottom of that trough. And hats off to the developers who are doing these plugins in Nina. Just about every three or four nights, there's another uh, nightly uh, case of Nina, and it really helps us with a scope like the Rasa because the Rasa here it is a very um, fast telescope. It has a um, an a focal length of f two point two or so, and that focal length is very fast. So because of the fast focal length, it also corresponds that you have a very small depth of field. And because the depth of field is so small, it's so hard to focus the scope visually. Uh, I mean, it's next to impossible because you're just dealing with something that is literally microns wide it's not even we're not even talking about you know millimeters we're talking about hundreds of a millimeter you know wide and because of that it is very difficult so i love the fact that nina can do our focus for us and do it by math and you can just sort of sit back you know i can grab a drink of water while it's focusing and let it do all the work because it's determining the focus by, uh, you know, mathematics of measuring these stars and how wide they are. Now you can see right there, it kind of is bottoming out now. You can't always trust the first measurement that pops up because what they call, what, what we refer to as seeing can affect one or two measurements. But... Uh, by the time you get to the second or third measurement, you can start to see, see what I mean? That one measurement was just a kind of a false reading. But by the time you get to the second or third measurement past this trough, we will generally start to see a trend line back up on the other side of the focus, the critical focus zone. And eventually, Nina will conclude, okay, we we pretty much found the bottom of the hyperbola and it will average out that hyperbola and again using math it will rough out what it thinks is the best place for focus and again the reason why we have to do this is because the temperature drops we're down to 21 degrees now 21 uh, even and you know, when we started the night, I think when I first came to set up the scope, it was 30, I forget, 31 degrees maybe. So it's dropped 10 degrees while we've been observing. Um, I notice also, see how this Pegasus Astro Pocket Power Box Micro gives us the voltage readout of what's being fed into the pocket power box micro so you can see the voltage here I don't know if you can make that out but it's hovering around 13 13.9 and varying up to 14 with about 1.3 amps and the reason why is because it'll pop on one of these dew eaters and then it'll pop it back off and that's why that's because it's trying to keep dew from forming on the corrector plate and again the corrector plate you can see in this uh, picture you can see it's actually a glass plate that the rasa is mounted to that the camera is mounted to on the front of the rasa and you can see that especially well on the left hand side in this picture uh, it 
if we didn't have that dew strap, then that glass that's that the camera's mounted to, that glass would just get covered with dew. And before long, it would just be, um, you know, completely a waste of time to try to do astronomy because you'd be looking through all that moisture. And on the picture on the right, it's the same, the same front of the telescope, except we've attached the dew, uh, what you might call the dew guard, you know, that dew shield. And it uh, also works with the dew strap in tandem so that it keeps the glass warmer since it's now it's protected inside that dew shield. And it also prevents just the nightfall moisture from collecting on that corrector plate as well. So it makes a good combination. And you can see uh, in the picture of the Rasa, the way that black dew shield out in front of the scope kind of shields it from the night sky. Uh, that, that really is a good one-two punch. Uh, back to our uh, focus, you can see how we are now showing a bottoming out of the focus. It's not quite done yet, but already uh, Nina was able to determine what it thinks is roughly the bottom of this curve. And notice how these images up here were kind of out of step, and it's trying to decide what is the true hyperbola. Were these three out of step, or were these three out of step? And it's trying to average between that with this, with this hyperbola curve that's making. And it's doing that partly by forming this other side. And there it's done. It's decided on a focus, and it likes it right here. So now we can go back and disconnect our focus motor, and we can also disconnect the camera. And close Nina now and open up sharp cap again and connect once again to our uh, ZWO ASI 2600 and now that image should be a lot better in focus that's at 100% see and the, there are no more donuts anymore so Granted, this particular star field, uh, you know, it's not a lot there to see except for just star pinpoints. But notice how we got rid of all those donuts. And now we're seeing these real fine, low magnitude stars with no little round Cheerios at all because now those are all in focus. So it's pretty effective, uh, pretty effective algorithms. Okay, back over here then, we saw M95 out of the corner of our eye. Um, wasn't beautiful, but it was starting to form up. Let's go back to our frame and just, instead of three seconds, let's go with uh, maybe 10 seconds. And instead of 400, let's use, we'll just use 200. And then let's uh, put here that this is M95. And let's live stack and clear the live stack. And we'll just catch M95 here in the corner real quick. Right here. So already that's a lot better image of it, isn't it? Now that we focused. So let's start our um, log M95 is in a part of the sky in which there are several galaxies visible in one field of view. And let's zoom in on M105 right here. And we won't stay long because we'll actually do a 
another view here in a second and we'll pull in M96 with it. Um, M96. There's M96 see. Center on M96. And we'll hope that we kept M95 in the picture. Yeah, there should be M95. So now let's go back and let's live stack that and call it M96 and clear the live stack and go back out to full frame. And then we'll use our um, deep sky annotation. Oh, rats. It pretty much demands that we plate solve first, doesn't it? I guess you can understand that in order to um, read everything that's in the sky, it wants to plate solve first. Look, double click to plate solve. Here we go. So here's M105, M96, and there's M95. So we're going to barely have all three in one view, 105, 96, and M95. Okay, so now let's live stack and clear. There's M95 up there. Here's M96. Pretty noisy when it first starts. And then over um, the collection of several subframes, the software is smart enough to determine uh, which become the stars and which was the noise. And how does it do that? Well, from one frame to the next, the noise doesn't remain consistent. Every single frame, the noise is a slightly different uh, view. And that noise, again, is all this pattern of splotchiness, you know. Uh, so before long, it says, OK, this is not noise, because that's in every picture. And it starts averaging those out. And before long, it effectively decides what's noise and what's uh, galactic uh, nebulosity, you know. And because of the fact that it's able to reduce that noise before long, it's able to make a lot better picture of the object. Uh, this is 80 seconds, so we can already see the object here. Now, if we came over here and looked at M96 in this picture, you can see what it's going to look like. It's scattering that all that star material in those spiral arms, just slinging it out as it goes. You can read. Um, read about it here. M95 and M96 are a fine pair of galaxies in Leo separated by a mere 42 minutes. They can be seen together in the same field of binoculars, telescopes, low mag. Both are spiral galaxies with M96 being the brighter of the two. M96 shows a bright extended core with a stellar nucleus. Also nearby is the elliptical galaxy M105. Together M95, M96, and M105 form the Leo galaxy group. Fun. Well, I'm amazed that we can come on a Valentine's Day evening with a 100% moonlit sky and come away with such great views of the night sky uh, that in spite of the moon being at 100%, look, we're already starting to see the black material here, black soot and matter that's 
covering up that star material. It's pretty amazing. We can see some of the dust lane and black soot. How do you spell soot? S-O-O-T? This is not a large galaxy, but beautiful nonetheless. And keep in mind, it doesn't look large to us because of the fact that it's so far away. We don't have a distance, do we, noted for M96. Let's go out to the web and see if we can find a distance. M96. Thirty-one million light years away. Look at that. Arms are ill-defined. Sure enough, that's what we're experiencing here. This is a live view here. Uh, that image annotation probably tricks us into thinking that it's not, but that's live. And we're looking at it real time. You can see those ill-defined arms just exactly as, as predicted. M96. So we're going to add M95 to the observed list and M96 to the observed list. And we're going to check these. And then over here in our Fly sky. We're going to search for this working group again and edit. And M95 we're going to delete it from the working copy. M96. Then we'll come back in Starry Night Pro and we'll say sync with cloud now. Nice. All right. So the last step of our workflow then would be to, um, you know, search for something else just so we reset and then search for lists again. And then in this working copy, we search by altitude. And uh, notice it got rid of those stars it got rid of that, those uh, targets out of this working copy, uh, which is basically 111 objects for light polluted skies. And tonight with the moon, it was definitely light polluted. So by using this list, we were able to see quite a bit with our Rasa 11 scope in spite of that moon that's uh, brightly lighting the screen. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us tonight with our Rasa. It was like, you and me and the Rasa. How about that? By the way, we were using a, an ASI 178, uh, a ZWO ASI 178 
as our sky cam view. This is our sky cam. And you see the little red 178 out on the front of this little outrigger. Uh, so tonight it was really great having you. It was Valentine's Day evening and we did uh, uh, we did a number of targets in spite of the moon, and thanks for coming out in spite of the moon. You guys that are still live on the, the live chat, thanks a lot for being there. Uh, thank you, Curtis, for being willing to be with us. You're out in, what is it, Curtis? Aren't you in like, um, is it Northern California? I forget, Curtis. Uh, or is it Idaho? I forget, but you're out west anyway. But it is 12.43 a.m., on uh, Valentine, Valentine's Day evening. So I think we're going to wrap up the live stream. But thanks for sticking with us. Some of you are with us for the whole broadcast. And as you can see, we're starting to uh, work on our, our um, workflow to be able to move things out of the observed column and in out of the to observe column and into the observed column. California, yeah, I thought so. Thanks a lot for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time. If you like content like this, boy, I would invite you to hit subscribe uh, at Emerald Hill Skies. And also, if you don't mind, if you enjoyed this, put that thumbs up and that bumps it up in the algorithm. What targets do you go and look at when it's moonlit? Because certainly that was a handicap we had to deal with tonight. But our philosophy is you don't stop just because it's moonlit. You still forge on. And you can see we did look at quite a few things. So we'll go ahead and stop the live stream now. But thanks so much for being with us. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. God bless. Have a good evening and happy Valentine's Day.